All right, we'll get started. Welcome back. I apologize for the horrible weekend many of you had, some of you because of me. Um, sorry about the stress. Overall, the exam was, I think, more difficult than the previous exams, uh, though the average was still uh, decent. The average score was, I think, 73%, and the median 50th percentile score was around 79%. Uh, I, I say it's a, it's a decent average because um, typically this exam in previous classes of 351 tends to have an average that's even maybe a little bit lower than that. So you're to be commended. Now I realize that that may be cold comfort if you didn't do quite as well on the exam as you what, might like to have done. In the coming days, once uh, folks have completed the exam, there's still some, a, a few that haven't done that yet. Uh, I will make it possible for you to go in and see the questions that you missed, what your responses were, what the right answers were, and like I've done before, I will make uh, short videos that explain why the right answer is right for each question and so on. Uh, I'll also make time available later in the week via a Google link like we've done before where you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one time slot to talk with me. Um, if you want to, to talk about the exam, uh, just uh, take a minute before we meet and watch the video on the questions that you're interested in, and then we can talk specifics. Um, if you're looking for advice on how to improve, one of the things you can do before we meet is just to reflect on what's going well with your study process and what you think uh, could be improved. Uh, there is one more exam. It's the final exam. It will be worth 250 rather than 200 points. If you want to sort of estimate or get an idea of uh, where you're going to stand by the end of the class, simply take your uh, exam scores up to now and add them together. Uh, you can, if you've turned in all your study guides and practice exams so far, you can assume you're going to get 150 points of, for study guides and practice exams. Add that to your exam total and then uh, you can project what you're going to need to do uh, on the final in order to get a final score that you might like. The final score is going to be out of a thousand points. So if you want to see whether you can get an A, take 930 points, subtract your current total, including practice exams and study guides, and then see whether that remaining number is greater than 250 or not. And that can give you an idea. You can also play around with worst case and best case scenarios. Um, but uh, anyway, that did I good? I want to make sure I even started the right meeting. Yeah, I think we're good. OK, so uh, any other questions about the exam? Uh, no, unfortunately, so someone's asking, is there a process whereby your final exam score can replace a midterm exam? No, unfortunately, not everything counts. The final is cumulative, um, and, but it will also deal with stuff that we're doing between now and the end of the class. Schedule-wise, I think we're a bit behind. I had hoped to be done with Chapter 12 by now. We will finish up, we will do Chapter 12 today and next time. Uh, so there'll need to be an adjustment in terms of study guide due dates and just pay attention to what's listed on Learning Suite. I'll change it to make it doable. The final is the day after the last day of class. I actually don't know. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I should know that, but I don't. It will be delivered online, though. Uh, so it will be a similar experience as to what you've had so far. Okay. So in the celestial glory of organic compounds, there are five heavens or degrees. Um, and, or alternatively, levels to a building. I don't know. I'm struggling for the right analogy. Last time it was a building. I tried something religious this time. Maybe next time I teach it, I'll try something from some gaming system. Spiritually enlarging, we need to check that box off thoroughly, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Actually, one of the end of semester comments that sort of tugged at my heartstrings a little bit was, yes, this class is 
definitely uh, improved my relationship with the Lord because I've have to, had, had to rely on the atonement so much during organic chemistry. Um, yep, I am the opposition in all things of which Lehi spoke. Like the devil, I have my job, right? <laughs> and that's from Doctrine and Covenants 29, which we learned about this weekend. Right? Even the devil has his job. Sorry, we're veering way off course, so I'm going to try to bring it back. Um, all right. So at the sort of top floor of our building, we have carboxylic acid derivatives. And these are molecules uh, with, these are functional groups that have uh, three bonds to a heteroatom, typically uh, oxygen uh, or nitrogen or something else, doesn't have to be oxygen. But these uh, functional groups should sort of look familiar. They are among the molecules that are sort of at the top level of priority in the nomenclature chapter. So that'll be the fourth floor of the uh, chemistry world, and this will be three carbon heteroatom bonds. Don't have to be sigma bonds. So I should be as general as I can. Um, I guess another one that might show up here would be nitriles. And uh, there are reactions that allow you to convert between various forms uh, without a whole lot of trouble and without a lot of special reagents. And I'm gonna call these reactions functional group interconversions. So when planning out a synthesis, often the functional group interconversions are easy. Making carbon-carbon bonds is hard and sometimes changing floors uh, on this level that we're uh, level of these built this building that we're talking about can be can be difficult too. Um, one floor down from the carboxylic acid derivatives you've got things with two bonds to a heteroatom between carbon and a heteroatom. So this would include things like aldehydes or ketones. It would also include enols, um, there's a, a alternative form of an aldehyde that's called a hydrate, and then there are some other molecules that you might have seen so far, alkynes, epoxides, uh, dibromides. Again, it's uh, pretty straightforward to convert between these functional groups. And in fact, you learned some of these in preparation for the exam. For example, you learned how to take an alkyne and convert it into an aldehyde or a ketone, depending on the situation. Uh, there are ways to go from an aldehyde up one floor uh, but, uh, and we're going to learn some of that in uh, 351. Uh, there are also ways to go from a carboxylic acid derivative to an aldehyde or a ketone, uh, but that's going to be 352. One level below, second floor, is maybe uh, alcohols and other groups with one bond to between carbon and a heteroatom. Also included at this level might be alkenes. Uh, again, functional group interconversion gets you from uh, one of these to another. And, uh, oops, what are we doing? Sorry, the copy and paste failed miserably. Functional group interconversion just what we need, another acronym in our lives. Uh, this is the SN2 slash E2, SN1 slash E1 chemistry that you learned in 351. And we're also gonna talk in this chapter about how to get from the second floor up to the third floor. Uh, we'll learn some of that today. At the bottom floor, you've got saturated hydrocarbons <laughs> like ethane. 
and it can be difficult to uh, go from a saturated hydrocarbon to an alcohol in, or a, uh, an alkyl halide. In fact, we don't know uh, any of those reactions yet, though we're going to learn some in chapter 15, which is, I believe, about radical chemistry. So stay tuned for that. Uh, why would we want to get from a saturated hydrocarbon to uh, something that's more oxidized? Well, saturated hydrocarbons, at least so far, are fairly plentiful. Most of the commodity chemicals that we get to make plastics and drug molecules are all derived from fossil fuels. Uh, and so they're easy to get and fairly cheap. Uh, and so the being able to take something that's fully saturated and introduce useful functional groups can be uh, can be cool uh, and efficient and very useful in, in making uh, important molecules. So uh, what we won't talk about in 351 is going to be, uh, as I said, reducing going from a carboxylic acid derivative to an aldehyde or a ketone. We're also not going to talk about going uh, from aldehyde or ketone down to the alcohol. Uh, with a couple of exceptions, we are going to talk about how to go from an alkyne to an alkene, and then from an alkene to an alkane. We'll do that in this chapter. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll do oxidation in this chapter as well. Um, a couple of terms in general chemistry, you maybe have heard about oxidation, meaning removal of electrons, and that's fine. In terms of organic molecules, we're gonna pretend that when carbon is bonded to an electronegative heteroatom, that those electrons belong to the electronegative heteroatom. Uh, and so the more bonds a carbon has with an electronegative heteroatom, the, the fewer electrons it has, right? So uh, going up is oxidation. Going down is reduction. And what uh, oxidation looks like in organic molecules is you're either increasing the number of carbon heteroatom bonds or you are decreasing the number of carbon hydrogen bonds. And then reduction is just the opposite. Decrease the number of carbon-oxygen bonds or increase the number of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay, that's sort of the broad overview. Uh, I mentioned there were five degrees of glory in the celestial Ochem carbon kingdom. And the one that we haven't mentioned is the fully oxidized form of uh, carbon, which is CO2. And then there's some other carbonic acid is another form that's got the same number of bonds with heteroatoms. And uh, most of the molecules, some of the molecules at this oxidation state are useful synthetically. In fact, some plastics are made by putting R groups on these oxygens, if you've ever heard of polycarbonate. Uh, but in general, it's sort of difficult to take CO2 and reduce it to something that we can use chemically. There are a few reactions that do this, but in many cases they're not very efficient and they're not economical. Uh, of course, plants have been doing this for billions of, or however many years, I don't know. Somebody in bio, evolutionary biology can tell me when mitochondria first started being a thing and plants first started being a thing. But uh, plants have an enzyme in them called Rubisco. I think it's ribulose bisphosphate something or other. And it is the, one of the key enzymes that fixes CO2 and makes it part of a sugar. Uh, and that's important. That's an important part of the carbon cycle. Uh, of course, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been uh, taking a lot of reduced carbon that, uh, 
that was generated through years and years and years and billions of years of accumulation, and we're releasing it and oxidizing it to CO2 as fast as we can, certainly faster than the plants can fix the CO2. And so people are very interested in, in fact, Professor Stowers, uh, my next door neighbor and uh, colleague Kara Stowers, next door office neighbor, we don't actually live next door, so I'll just clarify that. Um, uh, she's working on, uh, one aspect of her research is working on how to capture carbon. So if you hear about carbon capture, uh, sometimes they're talking about just removing CO2 from the atmosphere and then setting it somewhere. But ideally, you could use it uh, for some uh, process that could be useful to us. Anyway, that's kind of hard. Once CO2 is in the atmosphere, it's, it's stuck. Um, I will mention it's not even on this list of carbon, but it's an interesting problem. Nitrogen uh, is a nitrogen gas is the highly oxidized form of nitrogen. And in contrast, in biology, you want it to have lots of nitrogen hydrogen bonds. You'd like it to be ammonia. And so getting nitrogen from the air into ammonia is a major problem agriculturally. Uh, and it was solved uh, in the, I think, late 1800s, or early 1900s uh, by a pair of German chemists. It's called the, ha the Haber-Bosch process, and it allows you to fix nitrogen in the atmosphere in the form of ammonia. And this is why we can actually have 8 billion people on the planet is because we can now fertilize uh, fields uh, at a faster rate than it occurs through natural processes. So, you know, uh, maybe someday there will, hopefully someday, someone will figure out a similar process for CO2 and that can help us with, uh, with climate change. In any case, that's the big picture. Oh yeah, Rubisco, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. And I bet you want to know how that chemistry works. No, not particularly. Well, perhaps sometime. Um, it will involve chemistry from 352, though, which is kind of cool. All right, so let's talk about oxidation reactions you already know. Uh, one is to take an alkene and use bromine to make the dibromide. And uh, one feature of this oxidizing agent is a weak heteroatom heteroatom bond. In the case of bromine, we said the bromine bromine bond is weak. You can look up its bond dissociation enthalpy, and that's one of the reasons that you that the reaction drives forward because the new carbon bromine bonds you make are more stable than the pi bond and the bromine bond that you broke. Of course, um, we've also learned how to turn an alkene into an epoxide. We do that through a similar set of reaction conditions, only we add water, and that gives us the halohydrin, and then we just add a base, and uh, we snap that closed to form the epoxide. But notice that uh, the oxidation step happens in, uh, in the first step to take something that had no carbon heteroatom bonds and now it has two carbon heteroatom bonds. All right? uh, this step doesn't change the oxidation state of either carbon because we have the same number of carbon oxygen sigma bonds. So we would call this step, the second step, functional group interconversion. So those are a couple of methods uh, we have so far uh, for interchanging uh, functional groups. We can turn the dibromide into the alkyne using two equivalents of a strong base. That is also just functional group interconversion. And so uh, hopefully this demonstrates something that you sort of already know, which is it's pretty easy to go from side to side on the, in, the, in this uh, tower of oxidation states, but it's more difficult to go from one floor to another. Uh, and a general feature for oxidizing agents is going to be weak heteroatom, heteroatom bonds or uh, weak metal 
oxygen bonds. So uh, we'll begin by showing you a new way to make an epoxide. Before, that has required a, a multi-step reaction sequence, but actually we got a much better way to do this now. And this is with a reagent I feel like maybe it's an infomercial. Now you too could make an epoxide in a single step. The reagent is called metachloroperoxybenzoic -ben acid. I will draw its structure. But this, this is what it does. It trades a pi bond for two new carbon oxygen bonds where the oxygen's bonded to both carbons. Uh, MCPBA stands for the following structure. You have a benzene ring, that's where the B comes from, benzoic, uh, benzoic, peroxybenzoic acid refers to this functional group with the benzene ring and then metachloro tells you you have a chloro on the carbon that's two bonds removed from the peroxy acid group. Um, this is a new functional group you haven't seen before, and, and, and we won't talk about its, what it's uh, useful for other than making epoxides. Uh, this is called a peroxy uh, carboxylic acid because it's like a carboxylic acid except for the fact that it has this oxygen-oxygen sigma bond. Uh, molecules with weak oxygen-oxygen sigma bonds are called peroxides. So that's where the peroxy comes from. Another example with which you may be familiar is hydrogen peroxide, uh, which, do we have time for a joke? There's always time for a joke. It's a dumb one, you've probably seen it before, but there's two folks at a table and the waiter comes by and this one says, what would you, what would you like to drink? And, the, and uh, the waiter says, what would you like to drink? And this guy says, I'll have H2O. And this guy, thinking he's going to be smart, says, I'll have H2O2. And the waiter puts down glasses with clear colorless liquids. And they both ingest their liquids and then this guy ends up dead because he was drinking H2O2. By the way, it's all about concentration. 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide you can rub on wounds and it cleanses them without killing you. You can actually take 3% hydrogen peroxide solution and, and dump it on plants. In my office, I used to have a, a, a gnat problem. It was so annoying. I have these succulents in their dirt and everything and apparently there were gnat eggs, how do you pronounce it? Just gnat, but it sounds weird. Anyway, little annoying insects uh, eggs in the, in the dirt, and I'd be sitting there at my computer, and these little black dots would be floating in front of the computer and then try to get in my eyes, and I got angry. Um, so I read, and what you're supposed to do is just take a dilute solution of hydrogen peroxide and dump that on the dirt, and it kills the gnat eggs, and it oxygenates... It provides some oxygen, which we have plenty of in the air, so it probably doesn't matter. But anyway, it's kind of fun. You dump this, and then the dirt starts to bubble and fizz for, for a while, and you think, oh, that should kill my plants, but it doesn't. It makes them happy. That being said, if it's 30% hydrogen peroxide and you touch it, you're going to get a pretty nasty burn. So anyway. Uh, the, the whitening stuff would be dilute, some dilute form of peroxide, yeah. You would know if it was concentrated. You would be screaming in pain. Your tongue would turn white as you killed the cells on it. Yeah, I mean, gross. Um, okay. So let's show you the mechanism for this reaction. It's actually very similar to the mechanism for um, the bromination reaction. Huh. So let's see, I'm going to draw the peroxy acid like this. I'm going to draw the alkene here. 
the pi electrons from the alkene attack the oxygen oxygen sigma star and that bond breaks now, when we've had olefins attack electrophiles before, we make a new sigma bond between a carbon that was involved in the double bond and the atom in the electrophile. One of the other, the other carbon from the double bond gets a positive charge, except as with bromination, you've got lone pair electrons on this oxygen that's getting attacked. So those electrons attack the other carbon to give you a three-membered ring. And uh, this should look exactly analogous to what we drew for the bromination reaction in chapter 10. Now the product is the epoxide and instead of the peroxy acid, just the carboxylic acid. And if you look at what we've done with our arrows so far, we would have made the protonated epoxide not the regular epoxide. So how do we get to our final products? Uh, the arrows I'm gonna show you now are not as essential to the process, but I figured why not show them to you. Imagine this carbon, uh, I'm sorry, oxygen-oxygen bond breaking and uh, the electrons ending up on that oxygen. That's a resonance stabilized anion with negative charge on that oxygen and on that one, evenly shared. So it's actually not too much of a stretch. Instead of drawing the arrow pointing towards this oxygen, it's actually not too much of a stretch to push the arrows this way so that they end up on the far away oxygen. Those, uh, what I showed you before and what I've just showed you are resonance structures of each other. Okay, um, and then at the same time as negative charge is starting to build up on this oxygen over here, electrons on the oxygen remove the hydrogen and that gets us to the neutral epoxide. That's a lot of arrows going on in the same step. Evidence is that the reaction is concerted. Uh, why does it have to be this way? I don't know. Uh, I'm struggling to think of a good exam question I could ask you on this because all you would do is just copy down what's in the notes. And so I'm, I'm less interested in knowing that you can look stuff up and copy stuff than I am that you can think about things. So uh, I wouldn't stress about sort of this uh, part of the mechanism that much, but this is how epoxides are formed. Question so far? Yeah. Well, so if we did this stepwise, right, uh, as we broke the oxygen-oxygen bond, we would generate the carboxylate, the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid, which could then be a base and remove the proton from the protonated epoxide. And instead of showing all of those in separate steps, and I don't know what the mechanistic evidence is, but we show it all happening at once. Okay. Um, yeah, other questions? No. All right, so you can do lots of things with epoxides. One of them is called uh, opening the epoxide with OH minus. So, um, and just to sort of be consistent with what we've been doing so far, adding MCPBA would be the oxidation step. Then if we wanted to open that epoxide with say OH minus, that would generate this diol. Notice that that is not a change in oxidation state. In the starting material, I'm sorry, in the epoxide, we have two carbon oxygen sigma bonds. In the diol, we have two carbon oxygen sigma bonds. So we would call that functional group interconversion, not oxidation. Uh, nevertheless, that's a useful two reaction uh, series if you're gonna make a product that has two oxygens on adjacent carbons, this sort of one, two diol. Epoxidation is followed by opening with a hydroxide is a decent way of doing that. Now in organic chemistry, we like to do, we like to have multiple ways to do things. And so 
there's another method. Um, I guess we'll call this first one indirect dihydroxylation because you first form the epoxide and then you open it up. Air quotes in honor of my Aunt Dinah. Um, and then the next one will be direct dihydroxylation. And this is uh, done by taking the olefin and exposing it to a reagent called osmium tetroxide. That reagent looks like this. Osmium's a transition metal, and so it's okay with having more than four bonds. Uh, osmium is at the plus eight oxidation state here, so that's pretty dang oxidized. It's a very strong oxidizing agent. It's also toxic, so you wanna be careful when using this. Um, when I was at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California for my postdoc, there was one day where the alarm went off in the building and we had to leave, and it was because somebody in one of the synthetic organic labs had been doing something with osmium tetroxide and it had blown up and there was the chance for osmium to be in the air. So we had to get out of the building for the rest of the day. Uh, it turns out he was doing something unauthorized. Um, we think maybe he was making drugs. Um, terrible, terrible idea, right? Um, if you're gonna do that, do that in a, <laughs> Do that somewhere not in a lab where people are watching you? I don't know. I'm not giving you advice. Please, Homeland Security, FBI, those folks that are, you, that are uh, listening, um, I'm not advocating making drugs, but I am saying if you're going to do it, doing it in a research lab with other people around you is an exceedingly foolish thing to do. Um, all right. So uh, I won't show you the mechanism for what happens in this step. I'll show you an intermediate, which will be useful for understanding some things in the future. The intermediate has osmium bonded via single bonds to two oxygens, and then those two oxygens are bonded to, are each bonded to a carbon. Uh, they call this, and you don't need to remember this, but I might use the term, an osmolate ester. So the first step is the one that oxidizes the olefin. I won't ask you to ever draw that intermediate again. The second step is really functional group interconversion. This just involves breaking down the osmolate ester, hydrolyzing it, uh, replacing the osmium oxygen single bonds in the osmolate ester with oxygen osmium bonds from water and freeing up the diol product. All right. Um, I don't know why these are the conditions your text uses. I think there are others that work. I'm just sticking as close as possible to your text. Your text also mentions another reagent this, that will do this, KMNO4 or potassium permanganate. I'm not going to ask you to remember that or be responsible for that. All right, so you got two different ways to make a 1,2-diol. So what? And it turns out that there's some stereochemical nuances here that allow you to get different stereoisomers uh, from the same starting material of these products. So uh, to illustrate this, let's show you direct, or sorry, indirect dihydroxylation with this uh, cyclohexene. MCPBA makes the meso epoxide. Then that gets opened up from behind with hydroxide to give you a product where the two OH groups are on opposite sides. This is, and you'd get the enantiomer as well, which I'm indicating with the plus or minus. We call this two-step sequence, uh, I, I've called it uh, indirect dihydroxylation above. Your text will call it, I think in the chapter, anti-dihydroxylation anti as though it were its own thing. In reality, it's just opening up an epoxide. So you don't need to create a new drawer in your filing cabinet brain, but rather just remember that that's 
just epoxide opening that you've seen before, but you get the anti-diastereomer. That looks like I don't know how to write diastereomer and perhaps not even pronounce it. The anti-diastereomer. That'll work. Uh, so let's show you what the product is for uh, direct dihydroxylation using osmium tetroxide. Uh, again, I'm showing you the intermediate so you can see where the stereo comes, stereochemistry comes from. Here's the osmolate ester, which in the second step using the sodium I'm not even sure what that sulfite may be salt, um, bisulfite salt, uh, gives you the product where the OHs are on the same side. So your text calls this reaction uh, sequence syn dihydroxylation because you get the syn diastereomer. So anytime you can take the same starting material and get two different diastereomers out, depending on the conditions or the reagents you use, that's useful. Um, okay, questions so far? So uh, this now allows me to ask some fun exam level questions uh, where I might show you a product and say, how would you get that product from the cis alkene? And could you also get it from the trans alkene? So you want this particular 2,3-butane diol and it's an antiomer. And based on what we've learned, there's a way to get there from the cis alkene and from the trans alkene. So, based on what you've learned, what do you think? If I wanted, uh, if I wanted to start with the cis alkene, what reagents would I use? Because relative to the starting material, this is what a syn. Relative to the cis alkene, is this a syn or an anti product? It's an anti product. So you're going to go for anti-dihydroxylation using MCPBA and then opening the epoxide with hydroxide, right? This would be the meso epoxide that you would get and then you would open it from behind on either of the two carbons with hydroxide and that would give you your product. Okay, no problem. So how does, how does it work with the transalkene? That would install the OH groups on the same side. Oh, sorry. Can, we can't use this same method for the transalkene. If we did, if we used the MCPBA method for the transalkene, we would get this product, which is not the desired stereoisomer. In fact, it's, it's mesodiastereomer. So instead of anti-dihydroxylation, we're going to try the syn dihydroxylation version of this reaction. That's going to put both OHs on the same side of the original alkene. And then uh, if we rotate it around this bond, we would see that this is the same as the molecule that we've drawn above. Okay, I've definitely asked questions like this on exams before. Uh, later on, we're going to learn actually how to make cis versus trans alkenes, and that makes the synthesis problem even more difficult. But following the stereochemical consequences of these reactions is pretty important. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's, the question is, in forming the osmolate ester for the transalkene, how can you visualize that? 
Um, it can be difficult. I think one of the most if, uh, useful ways is drawing the alkene as though it was on its side. And then after when you make the osmolate ester, your two carbon oxygen bonds happen from the same side of that pi bond where one of the methyl groups is pointing out at you and the other's going back into the page. I, I can push arrows here to show you that both bonds form at the same time, but. And then, yeah, then we hydrolyze that. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Others? Okay. So, in our remaining time, let's talk about other things besides diols. Uh, let's talk about how to get from the second floor to the third floor. That is from an alcohol, in this case a primary alcohol, to an aldehyde. And the reagent of choice is pyridinium chlorochromate. This is a new reagent. You haven't seen it before. Pyridinium stands for a benzene ring where one of the atoms in the ring is a nitrogen and the nitrogen is also positively charged. Pyridinium is the conjugate acid of pyridine. Chlorochromate has two um, chromium oxygen double bonds, a chromium chlorine single bond and a chromium oxygen single bond and that oxygen is negatively charged. Uh, the pyridinium is just the counter ion, but it's what makes this molecule soluble in organic solvent. The chromium is the oxidizing agent, and uh, its oxidation state, you don't need to know this, but it's like plus six. Okay, so how does this process work? We'll abbreviate pyridinium chlorochromate as PCC. Uh, that you got so many acronym named reagents, so you need to do whatever uh, whatever memorizing works best for you to keep them straight. Mechanism for the reaction uh, at first is pretty straightforward. The chromium chlorine bond is weak and so what happens is an SN2 style substitution reaction on chromium where oxygen attacks chromium and chlorine leaves. At that stage, you have the following intermediate. And uh, your text shows, I'm not sure if your text shows arrows for this, just maybe says proton transfer to get the oxygen on the left neutral and the oxygen that was negatively charged on the right also neutral. Some people have proposed that lone pairs on this oxygen reach over and remove that proton. I don't like that because four-membered rings don't allow for optimal geometry for that process, but that's a minor issue that I don't intend to uh, make a part of future exams. What I typically show for these proton transfer steps is some base, probably Cl minus, removing this proton, uh, and then the resulting acid that, oops, it's gone. The resulting acid that you just made, uh, protonating the negatively charged oxygen here. Um, so, I, I mean, fine, we can show chloride doing it. I hate to do that because Cl minus is a terrible base, but it may be all we've got. Um, so then you get here, and at this stage something kind of interesting happens. It turns out that chromium now bonded to the three oxygens 
and including those uh, electrons in the bond between our alcohol, oxygen, and the chromium, this is actually a decent leaving group. And uh, if you look at the molecule, the leaving group is attached to an oxygen, so that's sort of our alpha position. And at the beta position, we've got protons, beta protons. And when you have protons beta to a leaving group, you should be thinking about elimination chemistry. And so what happens is uh, a base and probably, I don't know, Cl minus, uh, is, is, is a weak base, but that's a great leaving group. We remove the proton, electrons kick down to form a pi bond, and the leaving group leaves. I really hate showing chloride as the base, so I'm just going to, because I'm the professor, I'm going to do what I want. Um, our product is the aldehyde. The leaving group is this sort of weird-looking chromium, and then you have H bonded to whatever your base was. So like an elimination reaction, we've lost a beta proton and we've made a pi bond. The only difference between what we've seen here and E2 reactions before is that the new pi bond we make is a carbon oxygen pi bond. And if you follow through the fate of the electrons, lone pairs in purple here, used to belong to oxygen. They became part of a bond between oxygen and chromium, and then chromium took them away. So that's where the oxidation happens. That's the loss of electrons. All right, questions so far about that? Um, the useful thing, as I said about pyridinium chlorochromate, is that it is soluble in organic solvent. And there are a number of other oxidation agents that people use to oxidize primary alcohols to aldehydes. Um, what do you suppose would happen if we took a secondary alcohol and used PCC? What, what should the product be? hearing whispers of ketone. If you remove the beta proton from that secondary carbon, you make the ketone. The only difference between what I showed you here and the primary alcohol is that in the secondary alcohol, only one of the things attached at the beta position is a carbon, hold on, in a secondary alcohol, only one of the things at the beta position is a hydrogen, and a primary alcohol, two of them are. So you don't need to memorize that primary alcohols when exposed to PCC form aldehydes, whereas secondary alcohols form ketones under analogous conditions. No, it's, it's, it's simple. The instructions for the product are in the starting material. Secondary alcohols have to lead to ketones because there's only one beta proton, not two, All right? And then uh, would you expect that to happen? Ooh, no, right? Blasphemy. Too many bonds to a carbon. Arr, get very angry at that answer, right? Um, the reason that this does not work is because you can make the molecule where oxygen is bonded to the chromium, but there are no beta protons. And so you can't do the oxidation step. Are there any other byproducts of interest? I don't know and I don't care. I just want you to know that you can't oxidize the tertiary alcohol. So if on an exam, uh, I, I, it would be a dumb question for me to ask, what is the product when you have a tertiary alcohol and PCC? Well, I mean, you can look up the fact that it doesn't work. 
I could ask you though, why doesn't it work? And in that case, the reason why is there are no beta protons. It doesn't work because of the mechanism. All right, so uh, next time we are gonna talk about how to go not only to the aldehyde, but onward to the fourth floor where we could get to the carboxylic acid. It turns out PCC doesn't get you to the fourth floor. PCC gets you just to the aldehyde. But we'll have a different set of conditions for going all the way up to the fourth floor. All right. See you next time.